I thank you uh, today. Um, it is the lecture note number six, which are also on the uh, on Mobile. In fact, I take everything from Mobile and from the field that from the readings and the lecture notes that I have put in the This lecture note number six is a transition. I tried to outline. I almost forgot about them. Then I found them again. Because I, I wrote them four or five years ago. Uh, but I, uh, um, I, I outlined the transition toward marginalism how the economics, the ideas of marginal economics have been set up. Okay, the important point that I want to stress in that, in that uh, um, set of notes is that yesterday I forgot to mention, and is that in order not to be constrained by the principle of diminishing marginal utility. So the, the principle of diminishing marginal utility was the initial the beginning of the story. Uh, but then they came up with the, with the view that it may be okay. Why do we have to be bounded, constrained only by diminishing marginal utilities? We need we want our theory whereby prices emerge out of scarcity, because that's what it is, that's what neoclassical economics is, that prices are the result of relative scarcities of uh, either goods or factors of production, as we see today in relation to factors of production, in order not to be bounded entirely by the issue of emission marginal utility, in, still in the 19th century, and later it was, in the 20th, it was formulated in more mathematical ways, they got around it by not just assuming diminishing marginal utilities, but by a bit relaxing this assumption, relaxing the assumption, and taking into account uh, bringing in the notion of marginal rate of substitution. And it analytically marginal rate of substitution. Analytically, it operates exactly like the, the principle of diminishing marginal utility. It's exactly the same. There is no difference. The only difference is that the principle of diminishing marginal utility ties you too much to a psychological sort of thing, right? Whereas the marginal rate of substitution is sort of separate from the strict diminishing marginal utility approach. What is this principle? It is the notion of marginal rate of substitution. It's how much you want to give up for something else. You follow? So how much, how much you are willing to give up, I don't know, consuming apples in favor of consuming papers. Okay? So this is really, if you look, if you look at that, it's a, it is it, it it brings in the marginal principle, but at the same time, it's not strictly connected to diminishing marginal utilities. Do you follow me? So it's really a choice in between how much you want to give up of an existing good in favor of another good in your uh, consumption. Choice system, you know, system, and so on. that's what it is. Uh, but it, it, it obtains exactly the same results. There is absolutely no difference. It's simply that it is not tied to the psychological conception of diminishing marginal utilities. Okay, and I explain in the notes that therefore preferences. Once you bring in the marginal rate of substitution. The preference system has to have certain specific features, which is called convexity, and I explain convexity in those notes. Okay, what convexity is. So I won't elaborate now, but it's a, it's a, it comes from the topology, from mathematical topology, but I don't put any mathematics, I just explain what convexity is. And I explain 
in simple words, it's very clear explained. So you should not have any problem. Um, okay, what I want to do today is to uh, bring in production. Okay, so all that stuff that we have done in relation to marginalist economics yesterday is essentially, is with, not essentially, it is without production, it's pure barter trade, pure barter trade, and you do not ask how, you do not ask how things are produced. Things are brought to the market, it just started so they are not doing it. Uh, uh, things are brought to the market, to this ideal market, it's a virtual market, and we are exchanged at equilibrium prices. They must be exchanged at equilibrium prices. They cannot be exchanged outside equilibrium. You follow? It's a very crucial aspect. So that's why it's not a market. Because in the market, you go to Istanbul, okay, and you go to, I don't know, to any of the two major bazaars, uh, yeah. <laughs> then, then you start haggling, you start negotiating, right? you negotiate, and sometimes... Otherwise they don't accept it by yeah, yeah. The, yeah, so you don't exchange, the exchanges take place at many different prices, and, and you never know what the equilibrium price is, you never know, okay? In the case of neoclassical no. economics, this is therefore a completely virtual market, it's a computerized market in that sense, and I will tell you, it has to be trading at equilibrium prices, because otherwise it is false trading, it's false trading, you understand, which takes you out of the equilibrium, so you must trade at equilibrium prices. Otherwise, trade is not taking, will won't take place. So trade must take place only at equilibrium prices in this theory. So you can see that construction of the theory really involves, you know, very, very strong assumptions, very strong assumptions. And who has come to the notion that trade must take place only at equilibrium prices. Well, that was the great French mathematical economist, who was not a good mathematician, by the way. No, because he was writing to Poincaré. Poincaré is one of the top uh, mathematical uh, mathematicians of the, uh, 19, of the 19th century, Henri Poincaré. He was there. Well, Poincaré said, drop it. Just drop it. Just forget about it. Just drop it. You know? the, the, so he, Leon Barras wrote this, uh, uh, his major book, which is called Principe d'Economie Politique. It's always the same title. Everyone wrote the same so, so the book <laughs> in the same title. And he wrote that book, and he wrote his first novel in, 19, in 1874. Or 1870, the first model, little, uh, little, and, this, and the whole book, 1874, and he uh, he came up with his own construction that trade must take place at equilibrium prices. So how can you ensure that trade takes place at equilibrium prices? How? You must have a super centralizing authority. And he, in fact, invented this super centralizing authority, which is called the auctioneer, like in an auction. You know, the auctioneer says it goes for one, for two, for two hundred, and so forth, and then finally it says, okay, that's the price at which it goes, right? Because there are no further bidders. That's the auctioneer. So the auctioneer is a super central authority which gets all the information from the traders. The trader, therefore, yeah, it, the auctioneer has perfect information. Traders don't have perfect information on each other. 
they give everything to the God's plan. That's why it is. That's what is. It's very interesting. It's 1874. They give everything to the central authority. The central authority then has the information of everyone, and therefore on this basis can calculate the equilibrium prices. When it calculates the equilibrium prices, it announces that trading is now possible. You follow me? And it is not by chance that this construction, which implies central price fixing, not market price fixing. You see, the central price fixing is determined on the basis of all the information that comes from the trader in order to achieve equilibrium market prices. This, set, this actually has titillated, has a sort of uh, intrigued many people who were actually in favor of planning. One of them is an Italian army colonel. Yeah, it was, I think it, I think it did not make it to to the level of general because he was gambling too much. But he was uh, freelancing. This was before the, before the First World War. But actually his most important paper was written during the First World War. He was freelancing, providing military plans and, and strategies for the Balkan Wars and stuff like that. He was, he was a, cons a consultant. Okay. Enrico Barone, his name was. Enrico Barone wrote in 1916 a very, very, in the Giornale degli Economisti, a very important paper called The Ministry of Production in the Collectivist Economy. Okay? A very, it's a very important paper. It made its way through all neoclassical economics. I'm, I'm raising this issue because the theory of the market, which is used in the West, so to speak, Okay, it implies central prices, central planning of prices, which even Stalin did not think in those terms. Okay, it implies a complete centralized system of prices. This is what the economic theory that you get through textbook. It implies complete centralized system of prices that has never existed even in the Soviet Union during the, uh, you know, the, the five-year plans, etc., because there was always a whole market which, uh, uh, where prices were set uh, according to, to the real market, not to some idea of supply and demand, okay, in, in, in the agriculture system. So, but why is this so? Because you cannot to ensure equilibrium, you must give perfect information to some central authority. By itself, there is no mechanism by which you can ensure the uh, attainment of equilibrium. There is no bottom-up approach. Okay, that is the. It's important. It's really important to understand that. Valras, in his approach. He stopped. He did not go into growth, accumulation. Accumulation and growth are essentially the same thing. Okay? That is, the whole economy is assumed to have a given stock of whatever, resources, endowment, apples, pears, given. Okay? And these things are traded, and that's it. So there is no analysis of how you move to a second period, to a period in which the stocks themselves change. So the trading is uh, in terms of atemporal, non-temporal equilibrium, okay? It's just without any time specification, without any uh, mechanism by which you can tell what you can sort of tell whether the conditions the trading today will create the conditions for more or less trading tomorrow. Okay? You have no measures. And this is called accumulation, when you move from one period to the next and the stocks change, so endowments change, so you have more 
capital goods, more uh, machinery, whatever, uh, these are the conditions of accumulation. There is no such a thing. Although, and why there is no such a thing? Because he could not establish Valras. He was aware, he wanted to get to that, but he stopped his last chapter, not chapter 44 of his book. Just broaches, just it's broaching the problem, but it's not getting into it. Because he has got a big problem. How do you ensure that equilibrium moves from one stage to the next? That's, that's it. So, then came a, uh, an economist, a Swedish, very interesting person, uh, called Kurt Wixel. And Ludwig Sell, at the turn of the century, at the beginning of the 20th century, he, wanted, he really wanted to, to extend Valras construction of general, Valras Pareto construction of general equilibrium into long term, into therefore introducing capital accumulation and, and uh, equilibrium in a dynamic setting. Okay? Okay. So what he did is he said all type of resources, all type of machinery, building, etc., etc., can eventually be reduced to one element. Notice the operations. We have a complexity of things of which he was aware, a multiplicity of things, with many different machineries, many different stuff. And he says they can all be reduced to one common element. And therefore I'm going to work on this common element. But a building depends upon land, right? Uh, a factory as well depends upon the land. You cannot have it hanging in the air and so forth, or floating on the ocean, or on the sea. Well, no, you may. Yeah, you, you, you can. Yeah. Well, still, you see, you have to bring land, you yeah? know, in order to put it like the big airports, for instance, the Kansai Airport in, near Kyoto. It's a big island, British island, five kilometers in the, in the sea of Japan. Right? I was thinking about the ambulance. Ah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So, uh, they say, he said, everything can be, and it can be reduced to a common factor, which is land. Okay? And, uh, so he called land capital. So, like the capital, right? Like in the cap, it's land in the Ricardian sense. So, but, but for the capital, capital is the way it not for me. Land is equivalent to capital. Capital land and capital are synonymous in Wixel. Hmm? And then he said, okay, there are the common factor. I mean, land cannot be productive, capital cannot be productive unless there is labor. Okay? So, so he said, basically, the whole economy can be reduced to these two common factors of production. You understand that? You follow me on that? Okay. So in what way does he overcome the big sale? Why does he do that? Because Varas started with many, many. There are many traders in the, uh, in the economy, okay? They will give this information to the auctioneer, to the central planner, and then the central planner starts trading, etc. And when Valras conceived of production, Valras was by formation connected to engineering. Okay? So he had he was a mathematician, not really a good mathematician, yeah? but he had an engineering conception of uh, of the economy. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, I'm in favor of an engineering, not of a social conception of the economy. Okay? Uh, uh, social conception, you don't know what you're talking about. Engineering, you know what you're talking about. So, uh, 
So um, is his view, so he started Barras, uh, Barras. He started with many sectors, okay? So you have capital one, let's say this produces dishes, porcelain or whatever dishes, okay? Capital two produces cutlery. Capital three. We are in the middle of the 19th century, <laughs> so you have to tell you, you know, put automobiles, so there are no automobiles. Capital three produces, you know, carriages, whatever it is, or locomotives, trains of locomotives. And all these capital, linked with labor, they produce an output. Output one, physical output, okay? Then output two, and output three. Okay? Y is, is, uh, is out.
they have to start with different rate of returns, different rate of profit, which cannot be corrected within the period because there is heterogeneity of capital. They become, hmm, they tend to equilibrium, to uniformity in the next period, in the longer run. That's the issue, okay? So, and what is the mechanism by which you say the rate of return on capital one, say, the rate of return here, R1, is less than R2, so different from R3. If this rate of returns are not equal, by what mechanism you divest from one sector and you invest in another? So that's how you can equalize, because you cannot transform buildings into trams. So how of trams into buildings? So how do you do you do it through capital funds, right? And what are the capital funds? It's either is savings. That's what it is. Right? It's the savings. That's the capital fund. Gross savings, of course, because also the capital that you may decide not to depreciate the capital, okay? So you don't invest into depreciation. And the money, the savings that you that you would have invested in depreciation, they go into, into creating demand for other type of capital. Okay? So it's through capital funds. So it's through savings. Therefore, you must create a situation where there is a balance between savings and investment. Okay? That's, so the mechanism which brings about the uh, general equilibrium of Valras hmm, is the relationship between savings and investment, which is not now, but in the future, that is in the long period. Well, Varas did not manage to make this transition. Okay? He did not manage also because he got sick of it, he had headaches, you know, it's his life. He had headaches, he had terrible headaches, I don't blame him. He had, had terrible headaches and he eventually gave up teaching and researching in Lausanne. And, uh, and that's where he, Pareto came. But Pareto didn't help. Pareto did not help. Pareto too got sick of it. Okay? Pareto too got sick of it and what did he do? He invented sociology. <laughs> Yeah, he, he wrote deep from Pareto was an absolute giant, was a, a real giant. He invented, he wrote Traité de Sociologie, he wrote the, one of the most important treatises of sociology in, in one of the good kind, these are the founders of sociology, Pareto, good kind, these are. And he also was a very was not the inventor of sociology, like Weber, Durkheim, and Pareto are essentially the inventors of sociology. And Pareto moved to sociology because he said, the hell with it, you know? Just the hell with it. And, and, and uh, the other thing that he also invented is anthropology. Pareto was a very keen uh, uh, student to analyze, study anthropology. In fact, he was one of the very, very first people, persons to write on I mean, I'm talking about 80, what, 80 something, that sort of stuff, around the 19, the beginning of the 20th century. He wrote about Australian Aborigines. And he wrote, actually, in a very, you know, Pareto was right wing, was fascist, when, when Mussolini came to power, he supported fascism. Yeah. But, you know, he died in 1923, so maybe he would have, you know, only two years after, so maybe he would have, I'm not, I don't want to, to say that it would have been different. But he was very authoritarian and he said, look, you know, the world is not going, is not operating upon the logic of, of general equilibrium. He said that it's too much of a logical system. And the world is not as rational as general equilibrium theory, as my theory and Valras theory would like, would want it to be. It's not as rational as that. And therefore, we have to choose our side. And it's, yes, he chose his side, which was with fascism. It's very interesting to read Pareto's uh, justification for politics, okay? Uh, and he was also a student of sociology, of anthropology. But this is all the result of the fact that he got sick of, of, of these things. Yeah? That he said, okay, that's, we cannot go, uh, it, it, 
requires too much of a logical, rational, logical behavior of, from agents, from individuals, which is not possible yet. And so, Arras did not man manage to, and Pareto did not help, as I say, to move to the second stage. This is exactly what, what Ludwig said tried to do in Sweden. Okay? That's what he had to move to the second stage. By creating the savings and investment relation consistent with a general equilibrium story. But this general equilibrium now is collapsed into two factors of production. This is the one we invented. It. Two factors of production. Because he says that, that uh, everything in the final analysis can be reduced to land and labor. A factory cannot exist without land underneath, so it's made of land, essentially. A, 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 an agricultural field cannot exist without land. Even fishing cannot exist without land, because you need the boat, and the boat comes from wood or land type activities. And uh, and requires labor. Therefore, there are two initial, initial given factors of production. Okay, given. We start all the principle of neoclassical economics is exactly the opposite of the classics. In the classics, they focus on reproducibility. Everything is reproducible. You cannot have accumulation. You cannot. You cannot expand unless you are able to reproduce. It's the agricultural principle of the core model in the physiocrats and then Adam Smith and then Charlie with the living theory of life and so on. In the classic, in the neoclass is exactly the opposite. It, you start with given resources. You, you don't even start with production, you start with barter trade. So you start with given things, you don't even initiate. In fact, the best explanation of a neoclassical system was done by a British economist who was captured during the Second World War. He was in the British Army. He was captured by the Germans in the Second World War. And he was interned into a prisoner of war camp. And he wrote in the Oxford Economic Papers, after he came out, he wrote a fantastic piece, 1945, Oxford Economic Papers, which is called The Economics of the Prisoner of a POW Camp. The economic wrote that. And that's what he says. He says, this is the a, a prisoner of war camps is a perfect example of variation you know, of general equilibrium economics because there are Red Cross packages coming in. So you don't ask the trade in the POW come is independent of production activities. They depend upon the packages, the parcels of Red Cross coming into the camp and they start trading chocolate and cigarettes and, and all that. So there is a whole system of prices, it comes up. It's a fantastic piece, it's an absolute phenomenal piece. And how did it affect the literature of the time? Huh? And how did it affect the literature of the time? Did it have any impact? Zero. <laughs> no, zero. It, it, but first of all, because the literature of the time, 1944, 1945, they were not interested in POW countries. They were, they were interested in, it was a period in which Keynesian economics was coming in and was interested in growth, etc. So, neoclassical economics was not necessarily so, so dominant, okay? And then when the Americans made it dominant, it's the Americans, everything is the Americans, you know? So the Americans made it dominant. Well, they, the last thing that they want is to have uh, neoclassical economics to be equated to a POW camp. They, so that was, but the piece is fantastic piece. And oh, how did I learn it? Because of the, this great lady that was in Cambridge, whom I frequented uh, until, shortly before, until shortly before her death. John Robinson. It's John Robinson. She points this out. You know uh, that 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 the neoclassical economics, Malaysian economics, is really a POW camp. That's what 
That's what uh, I, so I went to read it and it's really fantastic. I give it to my students and seniors. Okay, so but but do you remember the name of the author? It's actually in my book. Oh. It's my Yanis uh, book, yeah. Uh, and so So what Bixell does, he writes this total output in the economy is a function of capital and labor. Okay? That is of the two, let's say, original factors of production. In his approach. And each of these factors, I mean, they, the, the, this production function has got uh, a, a specific feature which makes it a production function which leads to an equilibrium result. Mm -hmm. And the feature is that it has to be based on constant returns to scale for the two factors. Constant returns to scale means constant productivity. In other words, if you double up, say, if capital is 100 and labor is 500, if you increase capital to 200 and you increase labor to 1000, okay, output will double. You understand? So to double output, you must increase both factors exactly in the same proportion, 100%, 100%. You follow? So this is called constant returns to scale. Constant returns to scale to the two factors together. But in relation to each factor is diminishing returns. That is to say, is diminishing returns not constant returns, is diminishing returns. In other words, if you increase one factor, okay, and you keep the other factor given, okay, so the output will increase but at a lesser rate. You follow me? Exactly like the principle of diminishing marginal utility. Is it? If you keep the number of apples given and you increase number of pairs which are available, available, you will get a lower price of pair and a lower marginal utility out of the additional consumption of pairs. Okay? You follow? So, so this is... Now, this construction is necessary in order for, I mean, the constant return to scale assumption. Why is it so important? It is important because with the constant returns to scale assumption, all output is, as they say, exhausted. That is, all output is distributed between the two factors. So the two factors have to absorb all the output. Nothing should be left over. Okay? That's equivalent to market clear. That nothing is hanging around undesired, in an undesired way. Okay? This is... so. This comes from the application of a mathematical theorem, in reality, of a mathematical theorem with to, the, to this product. Because you could have thought of a production function in any kind. You can have all kinds of non-linear, you can have all sorts of production functions, increasing, decreasing, shaped like this. You know. But why did he think he was a pretty good, he was not a mathematician himself, but he had a pretty good background in mathematics. Why did he think of a production function which all output is exhausted, is absorbed by the two factors. So all the output has to be distributed to the two factors and nothing has to be left over hanging around. By using, because that fits the market claim, right? it fits market claim. If you exhaust all the output, all what is supplied is also demanded and that's fine. The market is clear and the system is in equilibrium. And the mathematical formulation depends upon a theorem which is called Euler 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 because it was specific to the question. Euler theorem. Okay? Right. Or as they say in English, Euler.
minus three. So total output therefore has to be absorbed by these two factors of production. How 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 these two factors of production are absorbed? By how these two factors of production absorb the output? How do they absorb it? How do you apply the Euler's theorem to this system? Well, you run the following, the following mental experiment. You keep one factor given. And you think, what happens to the economy, to the system, okay, if I increase the other factor? by say one unit. You understand? So one factor is kept even and then you do up likewise with the other factor. So first say you keep labor given and you increase capital. Then you keep capital given and you increase labor. And you apply the principle of diminishing marginal productivity which is exactly symmetrical to the principle of diminishing marginal utility. That is to say you apply the principle that the first derivative is positive, so when you increase, say, the economy by one, in one, one factor, you increase the economy by one more unit of land or of capital, okay, you increase the one more unit of land and capital, you get more output, okay? But any further increase will be at a diminishing rate. You understand? So you always get more output, but at the rate, the percentage at which this output increases diminishes. You know? You understand? So this is called the principle of diminishing marginal productivity. So it takes the form of a partial derivative theta of output over the partial derivative of capital. Okay? Multiplied by the capital available. Okay. And the same thing to do with labor. Partial derivative of output over labor multiplied by labor. So 
many apples and they go into the shop and they get so many apples. No, you don't have that, okay? So how, what is the variable, this is a variable, through which labor gets its share in the economy? Salaries, yeah, wages, okay? What is the element to which capital gets its, let's call it, its part in the economy? Its uh, profits, okay? Therefore, this has to be equal to the rate of return, the rate of profit. You understand? And this has to be equal to the wage rate. It follows that total output therefore is absorbed by the two claimants. There are two claimants, two people, two, two elements, two factors that have claims over output. The two claimants, mm -hmm. but you can add, you can have more uh, factors. I have two arguments, you can have three, four arguments, the same principle. So, total output is therefore the rate of profit multiplied by capital plus the wage rate multiplied by capital. You can, you see, output is. The distribution of output takes place according to mechanisms which are the same as thermodynamics. Same as Paul Samuelson put it. That is to say, they are determined by the marginal productivity of each factor of production. Do you follow me? Do you follow me? Okay. Now, what is the wage in this framework? And what is the rate of profit, the rate of return? Because the correct terminology is rate of return in the neoclassical framework, not rate of profit. Rate of profit is a terminology which belongs to classical. Focus on the wage rate, which is clear, but it is perfectly applied symmetrically to the rate of return. The marginal product of labor, this is the marginal product of labor, must reflect, remember that everything is market determined, in the, no matter how centralized prices are, and all that, everything is market determined in the neoclassical uh, System. So the wage rate must reflect the market price of labor, right? You understand? So this means that the marginal product of labor is the demand curve for labor. The marginal product, the marginal product of capital is the demand curve for capital. Okay? So each marginal product defines the demand curve for each of the factors and therefore it defines the market price of the factor okay because the wage rate is the equilibrium market price of labor the rate of return has to be the equilibrium market price for capital hmm? which means that the rate of return has to be equal to the rate of interest in the economy. To set the market, the price of capital in the market, in the financial sector, in the financial market is determined by the rate of interest. The financial sector is, is financial capital which is there as an intermi and intermediary in order to invest and obtain, uh, operate in real capital. Therefore, in equilibrium, the rate of return has to be equal to the rate of interest, which has to be equal to the marginal productivity of capital. Okay? And this happens to be 
What is the rate of interest? It's the price of loans, right? It's the price of loans, it's the price of, of capital. So this is the price of capital. So the price of capital is equal to the marginal productivity, to the rate of interest, and to the rate of return. Hmm? You follow? You don't see it. No, no, it's okay. It's just, I have uh, to do that. No, no, I can see it. I can see it. But it's not because of that. It's because of All right. This, so let, let's, let's uh, before we stop uh, for the break, let's now focus on certain features here. I don't want to overcrowd. First step. Yeah, imagine a positive. So, in order to make it clear, I will just move to another page. The margin of productivity uh, of capital is equal to the rate of return, which is equal to the rate of interest, which is also equal to the price of capital. Okay? So, how is this measured? This is measured in physical terms. This is how much more output you get by increasing the amount of capital in the system. That's a, a completely a mental exercise. You take, it's a mathematically based mental exercise whereby you take a derivative, a partial derivative relatively to the rest. And therefore you make this assumption that for whatever reason capital rises, is an increase in capital, <coughs> how much would output increase as a result of that, under the assumption that first derivative is positive, second derivative is negative, you get this thing, the equivalency between the rate of the marginal productivity of capital and the rate of return. So, and, and the price. So the price is derived from what? From a physical process. Okay? It's a physical process. Do you understand? So you, it's the measure, the physical measurement of an increase in output over the increase in the particular uh, factor of production, in this case, capital. And the same thing for labor. Hmm? Also, the marginal product of labor is the result of a physical process. By how much output will increase under conditions of diminishing returns, by how much output will increase if you increase labor. Hmm? That's, that's, that's all we come now to the punchline, to one of the main, I have several punchlines, so that's uh, one important punchline is that assume you are in an economy okay, that uh, all of a sudden, for whatever reason, there is, say, less birth rate or there is an expansion of capital. For whatever reason, we, have, see, we still don't, have, don't know where this K comes from. Comes from. They don't, we don't know where that capital comes from. We have no uh, analysis of the production. If capital is treated and labor as original given factors of production. Mm -hmm. Okay, in that economy, if I tell you, look, we have two economies. In one of the economies, two economies, identical technologies, two economies like identical technologies, okay? Say, Switzerland and Austria, more or less, they should have the same technology. They will even say language, but almost the same language in the bulk of Switzerland, perhaps a bit less late in, 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 in Austria. But so there's a similar, exactly two economies, identical, but we treat them, as John Robinson used to tell us, treat each of a production function as a separate island. An economy based on being separate island, okay? 
so therefore you can, we can be in the GNC, which is where we have you know the cyclists islands, you know, many of them uh, are similar. So uh, exactly two economies, for whatever reason, in one economy, all of a sudden they are ident identical in every respect. There is less labor because they were bathing, swimming, they drank, I don't know, whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> or uh, there is less labor. So one economy, one economy, one island has all of a sudden less labor, therefore more land compared to the other island. Okay? So if you are in your classical economies, you should come up with the following conclusion. I tell you the conclusion. In the economy which has less labor. Labor has become more scarce, okay? And the marginal product of labor has therefore increased. Because it's less, it's more scarce, it's less labor. The marginal product of labor has increased and therefore the wage rate has gone up. Capital, relatively, the other island has become more abundant, okay, and therefore the marginal product of capital has gone down, the price of capital has gone down, the rate of return of capital has gone down, okay, and the rate of interest has also gone down, because the rate of return is equal to the marginal product and is equal to the rate of interest. Then you should come to the final, that's the punchline conclusion, what the technique of production in the island where people are now less than before. How should that technique of production be characterized? Technique of production are defined exactly as in classical economics, the proportion of capital to labor, of machinery to labor, capital to labor. So how should that technique of production be characterized? Should become more capital intensive because we have now less be less labor, much amount of capital is higher, okay? There will be more incentive for capitalists, for entrepreneurs. I mean, there are no capitalists here, it's just firms. More incentive to hire capital, okay? So, they, because it's now cheaper, therefore, the economy moves to a higher capital intensive technology. Technique rather than technology, it's technique. Okay, that's relatively to the other uh, to the other side. So what is the fundamental analytical conclusion? The fundamental analytical conclusion is that the rate of interest or rate of profit and capital intensity of production moves, varies in inverse proportion okay, to each other. So when the, when the rate of interest is down, capital intensity is up. When the rate of interest is high, capital intensity is low. Okay? You understand? So, an economy with a lot of labor relatively to capital, but production functions must be the same, because otherwise you compare apples with oranges, you compare, you know, camels with eagles. So, nothing, no, 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 no compare. You must have the same type of production function when you have an economy which is abundant with labor, okay, relatively to capital compared to other economies, you should expect the labor abundant economy to have a higher rate of real rate of interest and a low capital intensity. You follow? Abundant labor, low capital intensity. Because labor is cheaper, wages are lower, and therefore there is a more labor intensive production compared to capital intensive production. Okay? Whereas the opposite would take place in a country which has more capital 
relative to the escape to the rest. This is, this is a very, out of this, I mean, essentially the argument about why wage flexibility is important for employment, for, for employment, for, to, 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 to say, well, you know, some employment is wage, wages should be flexible. What does, why should be fle wages should be flexible? What does it mean, wages? Why? Why should they be flexible? Yeah. They say, well, but if, if wages fall, more people will be employed, yeah, because of entrepreneurs would, firms would be willing to employ more people and so forth, as a result of the fact that they are cheaper compared to uh, before, or compared to other factors of production. Well, that, that is it. It's here. It's here. It is in this theory. This is the theory that tells you that if a factor becomes more abundant, its price should fall and it should be, therefore, its employment will rise. Okay? So the margin of the, if, if a factor is more abundant, the margin of productivity of labor falls, but the margin of productivity of labor is the wage rate, which means it is, the, it is also the price of labor, and in a, if markets are allowed to function freely, etc., 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 then this should, um, this should lead to a situation whereby labor is absorbed into production and the capital intensity of the economy declines and becomes more labor intensive. That is the, that, the long and the short, that's the story. Okay? That's the story about wage flexibility. This is, a very, this is a very important uh, conclusion concerning this. The other important conclusion is look at the rate of interest. What is the rate of interest here? This is the rate of interest which is similar to the rate of return. Where do you, the rate of interest, when you think of the rate of interest, what do you think? You think of a bank, right? You think that you go to the bank, you have money. But where is the bank here? There's no bank. Okay? Where is the bank? Where is, the, where is the credit, formation of credit? There is no credit here. Yeah? The rate of interest, this is the other very important conclusion because this is what Keynes went against. He went against the notion that wage flexibility will bring more employment, but he argued in relation to Marshall, not in relation to Excel. And, and he went against the view that the rate of interest, this thing, is equal to that. Why? Because in this way, you see, this is a physical process. This is increased output relatively to a, a partial increase in capital. Okay? So it's physical. It's how much, how more corn you get if you put another tractor into the, onto the field. Okay? That's what it is. So, the rate of interest is not a monetary phenomenon, it's a real phenomenon, you understand? It's connected to the physical increase in output relatively to the increase in the fact of capital. Because the rate of interest is supposed to be the remuneration of financial capital, which in equilibrium must be equal to the real capital, obviously, because otherwise you have arbitrage situation in the system. So in equilibrium must be but it is therefore made equal to a physical process. So it's a real. So the rate of the equilibrium rate of interest is determined in the real market for factors of production. You understand? Not in the financial market, not in the money in the money market. It's determined in. So the rate of interest is real. It's a real rate of interest in your classical theory. This is Keynes completely. I mean Keynes built the whole battleship there with all the guns to fire at this thing, okay? But, because, that's why he wanted to call his book in 1936, he did not want to call it general theory of blah, 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 right? He wanted to call it a monetary theory of production. But then, I think Macmillan, the publisher said, look, you know, you, you keep this title, no one will read it, no one will call it general theory of employment, interest, and money, okay? But he wanted to call it a monetary theory of production, because this separates 
the rate of interest from the monetary side of the economy. The monetary side of the economy does not enter into the determination of the level of output and employment in the system. Okay? So, next, after the break, we'll I'll talk about the monetary side of this. Pixel was smart. I introduced the monetary side. Pixel was a very great thing. So, so, so we'll, we'll talk about the monetary side when we come back from the break. Okay? Let's have a break.
the rate of interest therefore is a real variable that is the rate of interest the equilibrium rate of interest is determined in the capital in the real market for goods and services it's not determined at the level of the monetary of monetary relations it's determined in real market okay so what is the monetary theory, what is the, what, what is the role of money here? The, the, this is the next question. Then I'll come, I'll, I'll get back to the issue of investment and see. Money is neutral. So the notion of neutrality of money, which is used day in and day out by essentially uh, most monetarists, most even central banks. If you ask a person like Bernanke, do you believe that money is neutral? He said, well, in the end, yes, I believe that money is neutral. He said, well, this is where it comes from. Of course, now we have a bit of a problem. So now we, we, we don't. Now we don't really. We, let's not talk about it now, okay? Because we have. Uh, but in the long run, money is definitely neutral. He would say that neutrality of money. Why is, where does neutrality of money come from? come from? Where does it come from? Why money is neutral? Money is neutral because it affects, okay, only the absolute price level. So, output in the economy, okay, is also is a function of capital and labor. And that is the delta by the production function. But the price of the value, the money value of output, is determined by the quantity of money, stock, so gold, for instance, money is a stock multiply by the velocity of circulation, the turnover of money, okay? So, money becomes, is said in this context, said to be neutral because it does not determine any of the real value. See, output is determined by Y, physical Y, is determined by this thing. How? The value, the money value, hundred thousand dollars, whatever, hundred million dollars, euros of the GDP, is determined by the price multiplied the physical output, okay, equal to the stock of money in circulation, and given the velocity of circulation, how many times money changes. <coughs> so, which means? It means that in the context of this theory, which the role of money is only to determine the pricing. Because this is determined by, by the production function. Why is determined by the production function? So, therefore, it has no, money has no impact on money. Okay? It, has, it, it determines the price level. Therefore, this means that if that's where monetarism comes from, so this means that if you, uh, the velocity of circulation is given, okay, this is given, this is uh, the assumption which y should be, so it's not known, but anyway, it's assumed to be given, and Any increase in the stock of money should lead to an increase in the price level, given the velocity of circulation. Or to be more precise, any increase in the stock of money which exceeds the increase in output, okay? Any increase in the stock of money which increase the which exceeds the increase in output should lead to an increase in the price level. That is to say, 
should lead to a rate of inflation. So, money does not enter into the determination of the rate of interest at all. In this framework, there is no impact of money onto the rate of interest. Okay? The rate of interest is determined entirely in the real market. So, the role of this is what's called neutrality. Money is neutral because it has no impact on Y, on the physical output. On the, it has no impact on the market, the behavior, market behavior for goods and services. No impact at all. It has only impact money on the price level. And it has also no impact on the interest rate, essentially. Now, this was really too much, too far-fetched to say this. This, this, story, this story comes from way back. It was David Hume. It is David Hume that invented the, the quantity theory of money. Back in the 17th century, he invented that. Okay? Why did he invent David Hume, who was an absolute philosophical giant in history, in, in just about everything that he said? Why did he invent that? Because he was talking about the Spanish inflation. He was thinking about the Spanish inflation. And what is the Spanish inflation? Is that when Cortes and all those people got to Mexico, okay, they and, 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 and then looted the whole place. Uh, and uh, when they looted the Americas and they started sending back gold and silver and stuff like that, that gold was then transformed into coins and the silver was transformed into coins in Spain and the result was a, a Spanish inflation, the famous Spanish inflation of the 16th century. That was the result, okay? And this is actually the Spanish inflation had a very significant game, but it also impacted on Adam Smith because the Adam Smith is against the view that gold is wealth. Right? Because he actually says in his book, look, there was more gold in Spain as a result of the conquest of the Americas, and yet they become poor. Okay? So gold is not wealth. What is wealth is production. That's what the wealth of nations is determined by production. And in so the reason why uh, uh, David Hume came up with the, this quantity theory of money is to explain why too much money, too much gold, really that was gold, too much gold, if too much gold chases, as they say in America, chases too few goods, then you've got inflation. Okay? Too much gold after too few goods, uh, after few goods, that's it, and you get inflation. But this is true only in the context in which the system is not under capitalist production. Eh? What was the economy of Spain in the, in the 16th century? In the 16th century, the economy of Spain was small, was weaker in terms of production than the economy of Genoa or of Florence. There was less production, okay? The, 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 in, in the, in, that economy. So, uh, obviously, if you inundate that economy with gold and the output, the harvest remains more or less the same and so forth, then clearly you make the inflation. So, this thing ap applies, as a matter of fact, to a situation in which money does not enter into production, it's not a factor, it's not an element which influences production, because production is, in that sense, let's call it primitive, okay? which was the conditions of, of say, uh, most of Europe then, in the 16th, and then Britain broke the path, so to speak, and, and Holland as well. But in the context of an industrial society, this does not make sense. It does not make sense that money is neutral that money does not affect the is neutral relatively to the rate of interest and it does, the money does not enter, does not determine the level of output. This is it makes no sense. And case when decides against. 
way. But Big Sal was a very smart person, so he, he realized that that was too far, far fetched. So what did he, what did he do? He assumed two ways of interest. One he called the natural, and that is the rate of interest here, the natural rate of interest. So you have the natural rate of interest determined by marginal productivity. Okay, and, and then he called the money rate of interest. So there are two rates of interest. Obviously, in equilibrium, they should be equal. Because otherwise, we've got arbitrage and monopoly situation. So, in equilibrium. But the argument is yes, they, there is. They should be equal, but actually the movements are not the same. Okay? So he developed, therefore, a theory of monetary cycles based on the difference in the movement over time of the rate of interest. One chases the other. Essentially, the rate of interest, the money rate of interest chases the equilibrium, but it doesn't achieve it. And therefore, it gives rise to a monetary cycle in the economy. That's how we solve this issue. It's called, in Big Cell, monetary disequilibrium. This result was very important because out of the, the Big Cell approach came throughout, uh, until Keynes, the monetary theories of the economy, <coughs> which were the first theories after Marx's theory of the business cycle, they were the first theories of the cycle. That is to say, determined by the interplay between the monetary rate of interest and uh, the natural rate of interest. In other words, if whenever the monetary, the monetary rate of interest is above the natural rate of interest, okay, then um, the tendency of the economy is to have savings greater than investment. Okay? You follow? Because the real rate of interest is lower, so it pays for you to save and not to invest. So the supply of savings is greater than the demand for investment, which represents the demand for additional capital. You follow? Whenever the, 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 uh, the market, the money rate of interest is below, is below the real rate of interest, the natural rate of interest, the real rate of interest, therefore, whenever the market money rate of interest is below the natural rate of interest, then the tendency is for, for um, uh, investment to exceed savings, because it pays to invest, okay, and you get a higher rate of return than having saving and putting the money into the bank. And Therefore, as this happens, uh, monetary authorities, etc., and banks will try to to uh, um, uh, will try to bring the rate of interest, the money rate of interest, up to equilibrium level with the real rate of interest. But this doesn't happen simultaneously. So this means that eventually the money rate of interest goes above the real rate. Of and then creates a reverse situation. This is, therefore, the view that business cycles are determined by a disequilibrium between savings and investment. Okay? And this is another point that Keynes attacked very strongly. Business cycles are not determined by a disequilibrium between an imbalance between savings and investment. Uh, it will become the case, is why I bring it. So, now, let's go back therefore, what is the relation between saving and investment in Excel? What is the relationship between saving and investment? Without this difference between money rate of interest and natural rate of interest, how do you, how do you see how you should uh, formulate the relationship between savings and investment in Excel? Okay. It has to be formulated in the following way. 
Well, assuming an investment in Excel. So, in the 
classical Marx, Ricardo, all these people. Savings and investment are conceptually identical. They are conceptually identical. You save, it's like saving corn. Okay? You save corn in order to plant it back. In the, in the neoclassical system, no, because we have two independent functions, saving function and investment function. But they are brought together into equilibrium through the mechanism of the rate of interest, provided you make the assumption that the system operates under diminishing marginal productivity. Huh? That's, that's very important. So they are brought together through the rate of interest and the changes in the techniques of production that result from that. Okay, that's the big saving story. Hence, you can say that because of situations in the money market, the difference between the money rate of interest and the natural rate of interest, we can say that cycles and unemployment, because they recognized that there was unemployment, so they result from some problems in the relation between the money rate of interest and the natural rate of interest. Okay? So these are the monetary, monetary side. But once you take that away, the system should converge toward equilibrium. That is the same story. Okay? The end of Excel, but not the end of the argument about Excel, because now we go into the critical analysis of Excel, but we need two minutes of uh, just to just absorb, just just uh, swallow. Just swallow. <laughs> two minutes for swallowing and then and then we move to uh, and don't look for that for that. Okay? So we need capital and labor. So this means that this could 
things are not substitutable because they are technically it's not that if you put a, a one more bus driver into the bus or more, one more tram driver into the tram, the tram is not going to, to go faster even at the margin, okay? It is going to do the same, it will stop at the same stops, etc. And the other the tram driver will simply sit around just as a passenger, okay? Until the working hours of the first driver are over, then you can take over. The next driver stays at home and sleeps, okay? Or do, instead of sitting in the tram. So this is called not this is non-substitution. Okay. If you have non-substitution, the relationship between the wage rate and the rate of profit is a linear relationship. It's obvious because I can rewrite this, okay, in a very simple way. If I out of this I can write output is equal to uh, profit plus wages, let's stay in marks, okay? Minus depreciation. We eliminate the rank issue. So, output is equal to L alpha K. W, I can write from here, I can write W equal WL, okay? And you can see from here they can transform L into K. It's easy, right? So I can write N, N would be the number of workers necessary to operate the bus, okay? The one K minus D, which is the position, okay? So, Evidently, profits are equal to this. Okay. No, sorry, this is plus minus. Right? This is what profits are. I express not in terms of the capital coefficient of every single element because. I can express labor in terms of capital. You understand why, right? Because if I have That's what it is. 
this is equal to the, the, the precision encompasses the entire capital by the rate of the year. So once you, once you take the rate of profit here, divided by k, you have alpha minus minus mw minus 1. Now oh, that's a linear, that's a standard straightforward linear thing. Linear. Linear means that what is the graph of a linear? Is it a, a straight line? That's right. So because here we have uh, we have negative, we have minus signs, the straight line will be downward sloping, right? Because we have minus signs. <coughs> I can say that if I, the Marx Ricardo, that's a very, if the Marx Ricardo uh, the Marx Ricardo uh, story is this. You can see that the technique of production does not change if the distribution of, this is the distribution of income huh, between wages and profit. The technique of production does not change. It's determined by this coefficient. So in order to, to, for the change in the technical production to happen, you need what is called technical progress. That is to say, you know, new technologies, new inventions, etc. So alpha becomes alpha prime, n becomes n prime, which can be less than n because you have labor saving. So you've got to go through a theory of technical progress. But in a given situation, this is what it is. There is no, this means there is no substitution. That the technique remains income distribution changes because of class relations, social relations, class, yeah? Income distribution changes because of whatever happens to the relations among classes, but it does not affect the technical production. Follow? In the neoclassical setting, that's why Paul Samuelson called it directly law of thermodynamic. In the neoclassical story, in the neoclassical story, the technique of production changes if you change the factors of production. You follow? If you change the endowment, the technique of production is determined by the marginal productivity of each of the factors of production. So, the, if, for, if the marginal productivity of capital in the new equilibrium situation is lower, the technique of production of the economy would have changed, would have become more capital intensive. Do you follow? Do you understand that? Not in classical, because there is no substitution. But here there is substitution. The margin, exactly this equation shows that there is substitution. Because you take the marginal product of each factor. What does it mean? It means you keep one factor constant and the other one increases, and therefore it means that you can substitute. You understand? In the classical approach, you cannot substitute. The technique is given. You don't substitute. In order to substitute, as it happens in Marx with the business cycle, you have to go through a process of technological change. You have to have, a, therefore, a, an analysis of technological change. You don't have a menu whereby you say, oh, there is more capital available, I substitute it against labor, put capital, because capital is now cheaper. So I have more capital and I put two trams for one bus line. Okay? No, you don't, cannot do that in, in the classical. But in neoclassical you can. In the long run, because they were not stupid, okay? It's not that they said that you put two trams for one bus driver, for one tram driver. You, Actually, it's a, in the long run, this is what should happen. Okay, but the, but this is comes from a static view, whereby there is no technological change. You understand? There is, there is technical change, not technological change. You change the technical production with a given set of capital, a given set of technologies that you have got. It's like having a menu. The menu is always the same. Sometimes you have more pappardelle, and sometimes you have more risotto, or sometimes you have, you know, whatever else, you know, um, spinach and all that sort of stuff. Okay, and uh, it's, the menu is always the same. 
is the combination that changes. You see? This is this is the, the relativity. So this means that the same curve would look in the neoclassical world. The same curve. So what in what in the classical world looks as a straight line here? Okay. This looks as a straight line. In the neoclassical world, it looks like this. Very bright, very intelligent, all of them. 
the modern theory of international trade is Heckscher and Pauline, and there were two Swedes. Okay? Uh, so, uh, they, so, Big Cell saw that something was not working. And he came up with something which is uh, called capital reversal. Yeah? Capital reversal. Now, we are going to fast forward. So we move from 1906, whatever it was, to 1962. 1962. 1962 was John. Uh, well, first I want to move to 1950. 1950. In 1952, John Robinson writes an article in the Economic Journal saying that all what we are teaching to the students is completely nonsense. Yeah? It's a very really nice article, a very good article, because John Robinson was very, she didn't mean her words, right? she used to speak quite. The students are faced with this production function which makes absolutely no sense. Capital is perfectly substitutable, machines can become something else. It makes absolutely no sense. And she opened a big Pandora box. Big, 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 big. And, and she started a big attack on the neoclassical production. Big attack. And meanwhile, 1960, Piero Zafa published it because he fell from the mountain and he was told by Nicolas Caldor to publish his book that he was that he put in the drawer in the 1929. Because he says in the introduction to his book, he says well, that book was ready by 1929-1930, essentially ready. And so he put it in the drawer. He publishes that book. In toward the end of that book, Piero Zafa drops a line and it's toward the end. The book is 102 pages, it's not much. So, actually, the real book, the real text is 99, like the rest is appendix. So, he drops a line saying, technical production can move anywhere. Technical production can be anywhere. In other words, he says, technical production don't have to be like this, necessarily. There is no reason. And that's only two lines. A technical production can be something like that, personally. It can be something like that. And if you have something like that, you don't have, you can see here, you don't have the monotonic systemic inverse relationship between the capital intensity and the rate of return, which is also the rate of interest. Remember, this is also the rate of interest. Right? So, you don't have that. Here, you don't have that. So, he drops this line, which is essentially what John Robinson wanted to say, but she smothered it up, because she got very angry at me while, uh, while writing, etc. And Rafael had this absolutely pristine mind. Don't say too much, just say. Yeah, so now we move to, this happens in 1960. In 1962, uh, 1961, then published in 1962 in the, in the quote in the Journal of Economics uh, in the United States, Paul Samuels, Paul Samuels was the big guru of neoclassical economics, big guru, we'll meet him again when, when next week. Uh, we have two more hours next week, by the way, added because I was able to be able to do So, uh, Paul Samuelson, who already in 1957 wrote a paper in the American Economic Review saying that the Marx is nothing but a, bit, a little Ricardian, he called a minor, minor post Ricardian, he wrote in 1957, is a, is a minor post Ricardian, Marx is a, is, is a minor post Ricardian, really there is nothing we can learn from him, is uh, a uh, 
we have much better theories now. The neoclassical production function is much better than this notion of production and blah, 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 blah. It developed, uh, it developed a whole model to show that mass was bad. Okay? 1957. He reads this stuff that comes from Cambridge. And in 1963, he says, oh, these people don't understand. That these people don't know. We at MIT are so much better. Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We have more funds than those four Englishmen. And we have more Italian still here. So, uh, and we are much better. We have better, we understand mathematics better. Here is, uh, here is the, the answer to the John Robinson and Zrafa observing critic. But Zrafa was just too light to them. And he develops in 1962 a paper which is called the surrogate production function, in which he says no problem forms. No problem. Everything works perfectly. The pixel. There was an American who took up from Pixel called Clark. Pixel, Clark, that's perfectly okay. That's parable, it's perfectly okay. We have no problem. Distribution is determined by the laws of thermodynamics, that is to say by the marginal productivities. And I'll show you how it is determined. I said, you want many commodities? Fine. You have many techniques? Look, I also, I'm so smart. Well, something was the first Nobel Prize. I'm, he was the first, he got the first Nobel Prize. Okay, it was Paul Summers. 1969 and 1970, when they started giving the Nobel Prize in economics. He was the first to get it. So, he said, I'm so smart, I'm so smart, you wouldn't believe how smart I am. I'm so smart that I can build a Ricardian system which gives neoclassical results. Okay? And then you are cooked when this happens. So, what does it He does. I think I will just move. What does it do? He says, okay, this is a car, and your is his guy, the other guy Marx. This is the car. Okay? Let's start. I want to do it a bit more. Okay. More of it. They are not. So. This is it. And this is my story.
and then I have that, which is beta k. Okay. I can do the degree delta, I can make, uh, you can keep going to the whole alphabetical order, but so you can see here what happens at each point. So we start with the wage rate. We start with the wage rate here, okay? Make the profit. So if we start with the wage rate here, but what is important is to understand that in, in under competition, the dominant, the, always the dominant technique, the, the, there's always a dominant technique. It's the most efficient technique. The most efficient technique. I'll give you a very simple example of two techniques. One is inferior and the other is superior. Okay, this technique and let's use colors, you know, it's nice. Okay, and this technique, which is superior? The red technique is superior. The, why it is superior? Because you can see, you take the wage rate here, bring it here, it gives you this rate of profit. Okay, take the same wage rate, bring it here, it gives you. This rate of profit, which is bigger than that. So this is the dominant technique. You follow? Therefore, if these two techniques are in existence at the same time, and the competition prevails with free market, free, 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 whatever, okay, this should disappear. The economy should separate this technique because for the same wage rate you get a high rate of profit, and vice versa. For the same rate of profit you get, you get a high wage. So this is called the dominant technique. Okay. This is an example of why the economy should, under competition, should always settle or move toward the dominant degree, which is also the idea in other space. Okay, so in uh, here, clearly here you have the dominant technique is the alpha, the blue technique. Uh, there's nothing completely against it. Okay, so if the wage rate is here, and the rate of profit is here. This technique should be dominated. The alpha technique. As we just run this notional exercise, as we come down, we come down, we come down. I really like to teach this one because that way is nice. Uh, and uh, as we come down, we come to this point. You can see that at this point, the the techniques are in different. We can have, have I, that's just one, one, one little, 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 little point. Okay. One little point, the techniques are in. As the wage rate keeps falling in our purely conceptual example, as we move here, you can see that the better technique becomes dominant. Because the same with this wage rate, if we stay on the alpha technique, we get a lower profit rate and then we move to the better technique. And so forth. So we can we keep going down, and we can always see that at that point there will be a point in which the gamma green technique comes up. And this means that the production well, now this is in three points, no? but I can I can join all these points. I can have infinite techniques, right? I can have all shaped like this. You know? Look. Each of these techniques is perfectly recorded. Each of these techniques, take it by isolation. Just this technique, the red, the blue technique is recorded. Okay. The, the red technique is also recorded. It's a single technology technique. Do you follow me? The green technique is also. It's a straight line. It's not curved. It's not anything. So it's recorded. It's a single technology. If gamma was an economy by itself, it would have only that technique. If there was no menu, choice, no restaurant, nothing, okay? So there would be only the gamma technique available or the better technique available, and there would be perfectly the economies, right? And he said, oh, but in real life is that we have a choice, we have choice of technique, we have menu, we have restaurant, we have papadelle, we have rice, we have all sorts of risotto and all that sort of stuff. Therefore, we have we can put them together into one diagram. Anyway, they are of the same dimension, so we can do that. And they will intersect. And 
If, when, the way in which they intersect is regarding techniques, they give us exactly the neoclassical production function. Right? It's the neoclassical production function. You join all the outward intersection points and you get together the neoclassical production function. So you, Cambridge people, are a bit backward. Cambridge UK, he was Cambridge Boston, Massachusetts, right? So, yeah, because we are, we, are, we are Americans, we are by far more advanced than everybody else. You know, we know math, we know these sort of things. So, no. so, so what are you complaining about? What is this complaint by John Robinson? We have a complete set of Ricardian techniques that when they put together, they generate a neoclassical pixel production function. Therefore, even in a Ricardian setting, the moment you introduce choice of techniques, you want to introduce choice of techniques, you bring in substitution, you get mixer. And you get log of thermal dynamics in distribution. So don't complain. Hmm. We are MIT, you know, you are just little Cambridge, old stones, we are modern, advanced. So, the problem for, for Samuelson was that in, he, he, he says it in the, he says it in his first paper. He says, in the room, in the seminar room, there was a guy called Pierangelo Garignani. Pierangelo Garignani, he died two years ago. Or was it last year? I don't remember. Two years ago. Two years ago. Pierangelo Garignani. Pierangelo Garignani has one characteristic that he, he writes very rarely mathematics, but he thinks mathematically. So he, all his words are mathematical formulation. So it's a very complicated thing to read because unless you know the mathematics behind it, it's sometimes very convoluted. But it's actually very, it's very clear as a matter of fact. It's not convoluted, but it's a very, he, 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 he organizes proofs by words, not by mathematics, by logic. Yeah? And it's absolutely excellent. Gagliani sits there in the room. And he says to someone, what do you say? I think you've got a problem. I think that your system requires what he says, equiproportional inputs everywhere. Requires a constant relation between capital and labor everywhere. I think that your system does not allow for multiple different type of capital goods and multiple and different type of relations between capital and labor. That your system is subject to the same problem of Ricardo and Marx relative to Morpheus. That's what he Garignani says. And Samuelson actually is very honest in that he says in this paper, he says, look, look, Garignani made this objection. That's what I, I learned is by reading. Garagnani made these object objections, but I don't see the point. That's what he says in the article. He has a footnote that says he made this objection, but I don't see any point. Okay. So, for a while, silence. No one, no. In Cambridge, they were taken aback by this big counterattack by Paul Samuelson, the counterattack by Paul Samuelson. Zafa, anyway, Zafa principle is don't talk, so he didn't say anything, okay? He didn't say anything. And, but, four years later, 1966, this was happening in 1962, this paper, but in 1966, a special issue by the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is the journal published by Harvard University, where the original paper by Samuelson appeared, there is a symposium on capital theory. Yeah? And then you have a bunch of papers, the two most important, the three most important papers there are Paul Samuelson, Pierangelo Garignani, and Luigi Pasini. These are the three most important, there is one by Simon, but these are the three most important. Yeah? The paper by 
Paul Samuelson says, the neoclassical production function is false. Apologies. Neoclassical production function, false. Uh, and then, so why is it false? Well, he goes into a big story, but to understand why it's false, you have to read the Pazinetti and separate papers, Pazinetti and Garignani papers. Okay? And I'm now going to, which all originate from this little Snafla point made at the end of it. But it's actually quite simple. It's actually quite simple. I don't, it's sometimes complicated things are complicated because people don't have things clear and then as they write them they become clear. Uh, but actually it's very, very simple. Here it is. I will find something. If you take, okay, let's take the blue technique. And let's take, oh, sorry, what? Oh, because I have to, let's take the red, why still? The red technique, oh, which is a bit more like that. Each of them are perfectly recovered. What does it mean? It means that they are one sector technique. That's what it means, right? Or that all sectors have exactly the same proportions of capital to labor. That's what it means. That either each technique is just one sector, the economy is one sector, or that all the sectors in the economy have exactly the same relation between capital and labor, the same relation. Okay? That's what a linear technique means. It doesn't mean anything else. Analytically, it means that the production system behind this technique is so that everything is produced exactly in the same proportions of machinery to labor, right? That's what it means. So, this means that if you put the two techniques together and they cross at some point, either the economy is on one sector, that this doesn't change, because this technique is one sector. Or, if you want many sectors to have the same linear technique, you must have many you must have each sector has the same type of proportions between capital and labor. It's the Cartan problem that Maltus argued against. Okay? So, if you put them together and they will cross at some point here, right? they will cross like that and you will see what they become a technique. If they uh, cross the, the economy, there will, will still be one sector, or there will still be one uh, proportion, the same proportion of capital to labor in every, in every branch of the economy. Nothing changes. Here it's one sector or, if you have many sectors, same proportions of capital to labor in the economy. Here is one sector or same proportion of capital. Different value of the same proportion, but still the same proportion. It's each sector is produced exactly by each commodity. It's, exact, it's produced exactly by the same proportion. If you bring them together, you don't change that. That structural feature doesn't change. It's exactly the same. Okay? So this means that when the economy moves from the blue range to the red range, it's still every you have how things are produced under the blue range, in the blue range, and everything is produced, either is one good or it, everything is produced exactly with the same proportion of capital to it. Okay? Everything from this watch. With socks, everything produced by the same proportion of which is absurd. Right? If you move to the red area, the same thing happens. You ask how things are produced in the red under the red technique. Either it's one sector, or everything will be produced by the same proportion. There will be the same proportion within the red, which will be different from the blue. But Always the characteristic of the economy, whenever the economy moves onto this new level, will be producing exactly with the same proportions. 
So that's what getting at what you have. You have to change the problem. And indeed, so that's the fascinating thing. If you open up these lines and you introduce no longer, no longer uh, a Descartian system, but you have, say, two sectors in the economy. Say, you produce corn and tractors. Corn and tractors. Therefore, the proportion of labor to capital used in corn is different from the proportion of labor to capital used in tractors. Okay, so you have truly many different techniques of production, and it's enough to introduce just more, just a couple of more sectors into the economy. Then the likelihood will be not this story, but this other story. And then the end of the story. Absolutely true in theory. There is no way to fudge 
This, this is something that happened between 1960 and 1970. Essentially, it was a debate, it's called the capital debate between the two Cambridges, but essentially it were the Italians that sold it. Namely, it was Fasinetti, Garignani, it was another guy who, uh, who uh, uh, participated and he died actually even changed, he didn't change his mind about that, he changed his mind, Luigi's Valenta also participated in this, he wrote a very nice paper, he, wrote, he actually formalized that very well in a two-sector model that he produced in the Austrian economic papers in 1970, and that basically solved the issue, okay, solved the issue, in the sense that analytically it is solved, it was not followed, textbook continued to be written exactly as before, even worse, and so forth, but that's that's how the thing. It is interesting, and then I'll finish here, that a guy who is now very highly regarded as a kind of outspoken critic of just about globalization, finance, and capital uh, banks, and Joe Stiglitz, you've heard of Joe Stiglitz. But Joe Stiglitz is tried a last ditch attempt. So Stiglitz is a pupil of Samson. So he's a pupil of Samson. So Joe Stiglitz tried desperately to, uh, to, to, to rescue this thing. Okay? Desperately tried to rescue that thing in an article in the journal. In the 60s, late 60s, 69, something like that. And uh, he tried to find a, a system of equations that this thing could be salvaged and that thing could be discarded. Okay? So if you can find that this thing is, yeah, it can happen, but it's really not really a general case, you know, general theoretical case that can happen just by chance, so to speak. Then you can say, okay, but we can accept the, the main thing. And he failed, he failed, because he came to a general production project, he discarded that thing. Managed to, he managed to discard that, but he did not realize <coughs> that the way in which he discarded that implied negative wage, which is a nonsense, right? You cannot have a neg negative wage, you can have a falling wage, but not negative. You know, how, how much you pay, I bet minus $10, you know? minus 20 euros or whatever. You cannot be paid. So it means that you are paying, you, you are paying. Yeah. So that's how we got it. So that was laughed out of court and that was, that was, that was the end. Now I think that this, I will give you a paper by Pasinetti in this respect, that, is, that was a very important result because it tells you that you do not have automatic mechanisms. You, you can call them market driven, you can call them whatever you like, you can call them, you know, uh, bamboo, the, whatever, I mean, it doesn't matter, you can, that you don't have automatic mechanisms for the uh, uh, income distribution, and you do not have automatic mechanism relative to the determination of the level of employment. You don't care about capital, because capital machinery is a bad thing, you know, unemployed machinery doesn't mean anything except in another sense, but it's not that the unemployed machinery suffers as a result of that, you know, I'm an unemployed machine, I'm so sorry, you know. Uh, it's it. <laughs> yeah. So, and, 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 and therefore this result is, is a very, very important analytical result, which is hardly taught in economic courses. Okay, that's the finish here. Okay. So, you know, next week, we have three classes. Yeah.